application and use. So Paul, take it away. Okay, thanks Greg. Uh, I'd like to kind of go over some of the uh, things that we need to know about the models of the moon. You heard, you've heard a lot about it at this conference, uh, what we do know through a variety of different sources. But you might ask, well, why is this important? And, and there's a scientific rationale for it, but I also want to focus on the operational value of it as well. So I guess I'll start off by outlining what I think our challenge is. And our challenge is, is that right now the space program is in serious trouble. And we're in trouble because we don't have a uh, good, solid fiscal and political support base for the program. So given those rather difficult conditions, the challenge is how do we move forward in space under an austere budgetary environment? So I, I basically would argue that, that the way we do this is to change the template of spaceflight. And the current template of spaceflight is to custom design spacecraft, launch them, operate them, and then discard them after a period of time. Now if you could change that, if you could change the operational template of space through the use of space resources, you might be able to build big distributed systems, smaller pieces assembled in space and maintained by people and machines. So what would enable such a template like that to emerge? Well, I contend that the way to make that emerge is to use the resources of the moon and extract water, which we now know is present in abundance on the moon, and use that to create new spacefaring capability. So understanding lunar volatiles, understanding their quantities or physical states, their accessibility and the way we may be able to get to them are all relevant to this task of, of fundamentally changing the template of spaceflight. So given that, why is the moon important? Well, the moon's important for three primary reasons. It's close, which means that not only can we access it anytime we want to, it's accessible at any time, unlike any planet or asteroid, we can go to the moon any day of the year, but it's also, it's also close enough to get to in a few days. And in terms of light seconds, it's about a half a light second away. So that means that we can teleoperate machines on the moon in almost near real time, which allows us to do and create capabilities there that we cannot do on the planets. Uh, it's interesting, as you've heard at this conference, there are a lot of interesting aspects to the moon. So in that sense, it's a scientific bonanza. But I want to focus on the last one in, 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 in the terms that it's useful. And it's useful in the sense that it is a good source of material and energy resources we need to create the kind of space-faring space system I'm talking about. So we're talking about the lunar poles primarily because the poles are a microenvironment on the moon. Uh, because of the low spin axis of liquidity, the moon's poles get incidence sunlight at grazing incidence. So that means certain areas are permanently dark and certain areas are, are, are lit for, for extended periods of time. And this dichotomy of terrains permit us to, uh, uh, to have this microenvironment where some areas are nice and thermally benign in the sunlight and you're able to generate electrical power. And the permanently dark areas, of course, are areas where you might be able to sequester volatiles, which in general are rare elements on the moon, but they actually tend to be fairly abundant at the poles. So the polar environment is what enables us to, to make the moon as interesting and as useful as I think that it is. And what do we know about the poles? Well, we know quite a bit. We know a little bit about the terrain. The terrain is highlands, uh, mature highland surface, which means that it has average slopes between 5 and 15 degrees. And some slopes that might be quite a bit steeper. So they're really the walls of fresh craters like Shackleton are as steep as 35 degrees. But in general, it's, it's a terrain that we know how to handle because we have been there. We have been to terrains like that on the moon before, both robotically and with people. Uh, the sunlit areas are actually fairly thermally benign. A, a sunlit area near the pole of the moon is about minus 50 centigrade, which is a nice temperature. Full-on surfaces exposed to sunlight will receive full solar incidence, so you can generate electrical power there. But the dark areas are what have drawn all the attention, primarily because they're extremely cold. We now know exactly how cold they are. They're, they're, they're sometimes as low as 25 Kelvin and sometimes as high as 70 Kelvin. So the, the effect of these two things, the sunlight and the darkness, permit us to set up and maintain a sustainable presence on the moon. And this can be a presence with both robotic machines teleoperated from Earth and with people, ultimately, when we get ready to go there. Now, in terms of materials, we now know, as you've heard through several talks, that there is water on the moon. And I want to kind of talk a little bit about that, about the various forms of water, because I think that's essentially what, we really, what really enables the long-term presence there. Uh, the exact amounts that are there and their states and physical uh, properties are the big unknowns, and we'll talk about that as we go on. So 
First, I want to talk about some of the lighting. And, and this is some of the really exciting results. Some of the first things we got when uh, Kaguya and Chandrayaan first returned to the moon were pictures of the poles at, at, at uh, a variety of viewing geometries and illumination conditions. So we could actually see what the lighting conditions were in parts of the pole. What we found is little, this map here at the top shows the uh, Clementine lighting map that we derived from Clementine images back in 1994. Uh, and you see three points there marked A, B, and C. These are areas that we thought got quite a bit of solar illumination. Uh, this Kaguya high-definition television image shows uh, the South Pole. Shackleton is in the foreground. And you see the points A, B, and C are all high areas on a, an elongate massif that's part of the inner ring of the SPA basin. So this sort of explains why these areas are illuminated. They're high areas of a massif that stick up into the sunlight. And that's why they get an, an abnormal amount of solar illumination. By the way, these points in the southern winter get, are illuminated for about 80% uh, 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 of the time. But now we have much better, much higher resolution data from the lunar, uh, the LROC low altimeter and from the WAC imaging experiment. These are two images made by the WAC team showing the lighting conditions at both the North Pole and the South Pole. Bright areas are in, a lot, are in high degrees of sunlight, and dark areas are in permanent darkness. And you'll see that it, they're heterogeneously distributed, but at both poles, there are areas of high solar illumination in proximity to areas of permanent darkness. Now that sets up a very favorable and fortuitous condition. If we can locate areas that have excess amounts of volatiles that are close to areas that have high degrees of solar illumination, those are actually the spots that have the highest priority for permanent presence. Those are areas where we can go, stay, generate electrical power, and extract water from the moon to actually make the various products that water will do. In addition, LRO carried this marvelous instrument called the Viner, which measured the thermal emission spectra from the moon and actually measured the surface temperature over a variety of conditions. Uh, water ice will be stable on the moon any place where the temperature, the maximum temperature is less than 104 Kelvin. And what you find is by looking at both poles, there are numerous areas that satisfy those conditions. On these maps here at the bottom, these are the maximum daily temperatures that either pole receives. Anything that is blue or cooler in color are effectively cold traps, areas where the water is stable at the surface. Moreover, if you extend that stability field areas that, that are below a few centimeters of, de of dry, desiccated regolith, that actually is a much larger area. It gets up into the yellow where, thing, where ice might be stable. So in fact, ice and water is stable over quite a large area over both poles. The question is, is it there? And if it's there, how much is there? So I want to break down now. I want to talk about the evidence for lunar water and kind of give some rough idea of how much we think might be there. I call this the five flavors of lunar water because it's five different occurrences that occur that, that, that through which the moon displays its hydrosphere. So the first one, which was a big surprise, was that water is actually in the interior of the moon. And we actually found this out before we returned with the uh, SMART-1 mission back in the, uh, around 2007 with a paper that actually measured trapped water in the green glass from Apollo 15. There are water and hydroxyl molecules on the surface at high latitudes on the moon. This was discovered by the M-cube experiment on Chandrayaan. There's exospheric water in the space above the moon, and specifically the space above the lunar south pole, which was measured by the moon impact probe from Chandrayaan. There's water ice at mixed into the regolith in the polar regions that we saw from L-cross and the L-cross impact. And finally, I believe there's, there's evidence for some thick water ice deposits in some of the permanently shadowed craters near the poles. So now let's look at sort of what some of the evidence might be. Before I get into that, I want to show two slides that I pinched from Paul Lucy, which kind of show the possible sources for lunar polar volatiles. There are actually quite a few of them. Uh, aside from the obvious ones of comets and water-bearing meteorites, there are things like the, uh, the solar wind, which is a constant implanting of solar wind protons on the moon those protons in the presence of heat can reduce metal oxides in the soil to native metal and hydroxyl. And it's probably the process that's going on with some of the M-cube results. There are interplanetary dust particles and possibly even water caught up in the geotail of the Earth. There are a lot of different sources for water. The question is how much of this water that the moon obviously encounters remains on the moon and how much is lost to space. And they actually, these processes are only understood in principle, not in magnitude and not in, in, in degree. And another cartoon from Paul, which shows sort of the processes that might occur where you might add water to the moon and then lose water. But in effect, you're constantly adding water to the moon through impact and possibly through water generation 
from solar wind interaction that water is not, sta is not static, it's in motion. It's trying, constantly trying to move to an area where it's more stable. And on the moon, cooler is stable. So in terms of the random walk, you should see a gradual progression of water molecules from the lower latitudes to the higher latitudes. And of course, if it gets into a cold trap, it's there forever. So effectively, that's the way to sequester the water for geologic time. Now, we first got a good measurement of uh, the possibility of polar water from the Lunar Prospector mission, which carried a neutron spectrometer. And effectively, it had a very poor uh, uh, surface resolution because its surface was a four pi instrument, so its resolution was fixed by the orbital al altitude. But in effect, we got about a 50 kilometer resolution map of the moon. And it showed that there was a gradual enhancement of, of uh, hydrogen content near the poles, but we couldn't really see where it was going. Now, the LP team has done some, something called Pixon modeling, where they actually model the presence of water in the dark areas that would produce the neutron signal they see. And these results are shown in these two maps, which uh, come from uh, Dave Lawrence and Rick Elphick. And what you see is water equivalent hydrogen color coded, superimposed on the topographic map of the upper 10 degrees of the polar latitudes of the moon. The north pole is at the top, the south pole is at the bottom. And what you see is a variety of craters which have permanent shadow that basically show evidence for, the, for at least a few weight percent of hydrogen. It's important to keep in mind for this map is that the neutron spectrometer only samples the upper 50 to 100 centimeters of the moon. It does not look any deeper than that. So in actual fact, we're only looking at the uppermost surface layer of the, of the moon when we look at, at the neutron data. Now, one of the big surprises in terms of finding water in the moon was the discovery of indigenous lunar water. And this was first found in the Apollo 15 green glass pyroclastics, which may contain up to 50 parts per million inside the glass. This is not surface correlated uh, water. This is actually water that was in the magma. And from the uh, concentrations in the glass and, and, and calculated diffusion profiles, it implies that the water content of their source rocks in the mantle was anywhere from 250 to 700 parts per million in the source regions. Interesting thing about the green glass is it is, ex it is an extremely primitive magma. It's either very, very high degrees of partial melting or it comes from very deep in the moon, deeper than 400 kilometers, which means that the mantle itself actually contains a significant amount of water. And this was all probably one of the volatiles involved in driving the pyroclastic eruptions in which these are found. Now, since this paper was published in 2007, we since found that there are water-bearing minerals in some of the lunar rocks as well. That's sort of corroborating evidence. It further suggests that the actual story of in indigenous and interior lunar water is not yet fully told. There's still some things that we don't fully understand about it. The big surprise coming from M cubed on Chandrayaan was the fact that there appears to be surface correlated water. This is basically uh, evidence for a 2.8 micron absorption band uh, on the moon, which begins at about 65 degrees latitude at both north and south and increases in intensity as you go poleward. And in effect, this is evidence for a fine grain or a mono layer of water or and or hydroxyl on, on the surfaces of mineral grains in this part of the moon. Now, potentially, this is interesting because it is potentially an extremely large source reservoir for water. If that water is in motion, and, and in fact, evidence from epoxy and Cassini suggests that it is in motion, it actually moves during the coolest parts. It, it, in the highest parts of the day, it moves away toward the pole, toward the cooler latitudes. And effectively, you have this water moving, randomly hopping up toward the poles and being retained preferentially at the cooler northern, lati northern and southern latitudes. Now, one of the interesting experiments done on Chandrayaan was the deployment of a probe. It was basically uh, separated and deorbited from the main orbiter at the equator and then impacted very near the south pole of the moon. And as they got down to around 80 degrees latitude, the mass spectrometer on board the moon impact probe detected uh, a water spike. And in fact, it was at an abundance about two orders of magnitude greater than what they had observed at the equatorial region. Now, their interpretation was that this, the probe had flown through an exospheric cloud of water. This is a very important result if it can be confirmed. And in fact, Laddie should be able to see some of this exospheric water as part of its mission profile. This would be the water that we, that we hypothesize is in motion as the adsorbed water seen in the m cubed data is at gradually moving toward the cooler latitudes of the pole. Now, of course, we all know about the LPROS results. This was a single point measurement, but it's highly significant because it was the first direct detection 
of true ice and water on the moon uh, by impacting the, the upper, uh, the centaur uh, stage of the launch vehicle into the Cabeus crater floor and then watching the output of the plume that came out of that. And in effect, we, the, the, there were two interesting things about Elcross. The first and most significant was that it verified that indeed there is water ice there, and it's there in a fairly significant amount, between 5 and 10 weight percent, which is a non-trivial amount of water. It's orders of magnitude greater than any uh, hydrogen concentration we had seen from an equatorial site. But in addition, we found evidence for a lot of other volatiles, including things like methane, ammonia, carbon dioxide, all of which appear to be present in more or less cometary abundance. So this suggests that at least in this crater, we may have direct evidence for a primarily cometary source for the lunar volatiles we see, at least at the South Pole. Now I want to talk a little bit about the radar data and what we think that tells us. Uh, this, is a, this is still ongoing, but in effect, radar does not sense hydrogen or ice directly. What it does is it measures the diffuse scattering properties of lunar materials. It turns out that ice is unusual in that it is RF transparent. Uh, silicates uh, will absorb a certain amount of energy, so you get an effective, uh, a fairly deep depth of penetration with radar as opposed to, to light. Uh, and that's dependent on the wavelength. The longer the wavelength, the deeper the penetration. Ice effectively has is a no-loss medium. So if I have a thick deposit of ice, I will get a great deal of penetration by RF energy, and I'll get two effects from that. I'll get multiple scattering, because the ice will have imperfections and inclusions, which will cause reflection of radio waves. And then there's an interferometric effect called the coherent opposition effect, which basically is an interferometric addition of waves when you're looking at ice at zero phase. And that increases the brightness and increases something called the circular polarization ratio, which is merely the ratio of the transmitted sense to the, uh, to the received sense, same sense to the opposite sense. So in effect, two things can produce high CPR. Ice through basically the, the, the long transmit path and the Kobe effect but also very rough surfaces can produce it as well. So you see high CPR associated with blocky craters, but also high CPR associated with ice deposits. So the, the net effect of this is to, is to say that, we, that CPR does not uniquely identify ice, and in part that's been the source of some of the controversy about the radar results. It is not a unique detection signature. It has to be looked at in the context of the other things that we see. So MINI-RF was an experiment. There are two versions of it. One flew on Chandrayaan, one flew on the LRO spacecraft. And effectively, it is an S-band side-looking radar that mapped the poles of the moon uh, and, and looked for this signature of high CPR associated with polar craters. I want to show a couple of examples of what we, of what we found. The top example in this slide is the crater Main L. Uh, Mark Robinson just showed a spectacular view of that where he imaged the interior of it. Portions of Main L are dark. But when you look at Main L, it's basically a fresh crater. It has rays. It, it has a very rough, hummocky uh, textured ejecta. It has a lot of blocks. And what you see with Main L is you see a high CPR signal. The middle, uh, top middle diagram shows a diffuse, bright CPR signature with Main L. The dotted line is the crater rim. And you see high CPR inside the crater and outside the crater. And that's what you'd expect if you had basically a, a rough surface. On the other hand, you also see things that we call anomalous, craters like Rozhevinsky N, which has high CPR within the crater rim, but it has very low CPR outside of that rim. And in fact, the two histograms show there's quite a bit of difference. The difference between the two is that Rozhevinsky N is in near permanent darkness. And in fact, when you map these craters across the polar areas of the moon, you find a high concentration of anomalous craters uh, near both poles. In fact, there's a very nice concentration uh, near the crater Peary near the North Pole, which has some beautiful craters that show this effect, where you have high CPR interior coatings and very low CPR exterior to them. So when you combine these data together, you can't uniquely identify ice via the radar. When you combine them together, what you find is that these dark areas near the poles, which also contain what we found to be modeled areas of high, of high hydrogen from the neutron spectrometer, correspond reasonably well with our maps of anomalous craters. It's not a one-to-one -one correspondence, so it's not perfect, but there is a high degree of correspondence. So the maps on the far right are the anomalous craters we see at the north and the top and the south and the bottom, compared with both the, the, light, the, the lighting maps, dark is permanent shadow, and the neutron data in the middle. Now all three of these data sets together suggest that these anomalous craters might be might contain ice, and if they do contain ice, it's present in a fairly significant quantity. It's not a thin coating, 
it has to be at least several tens of wavelengths. So the wavelength of this radar is 12.5 centimeters. That means we're talking about at least two to three to several meters thicknesses of ice, if it is indeed ice. So to summarize, here we have this, this lunar hydrosphere with five different flavors, five occurrences of water, all of us telling that the moon's hydrosphere is a complex and very dynamic system. And in fact, it's one in which we still don't fully understand the details. So we can't really right now tell, say, here's the best place to go to actually use this water. We need quite a bit of more information. And so I want to just close by, by, by pointing out what some of the knowledge requirements are and how we might get that information. So what don't we know about lunar volatiles? Well, actually, just about everything is important. We don't know their species or concentrations. We don't know the scales of heterogeneity. Do they vary, how they vary on meter, decameter, and kilometer scales. We don't know what their terrain properties are and what the geotechnical properties are. If this stuff is ice, is it fairy castle structure? Or is it very dense and crystal? Uh, either of those two conditions have very different implications for the way you would access it and try to extract the water. We don't know what the thermal conditions are in some of the areas, and especially in the transitional areas between the cold traps and the permanently lit zones. We want to know what the lighting conditions are actually at the surface. Some of the areas that we think might be in, permanent, uh, in, 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 in near permanent sunlight and the areas adjacent to it that are dark might be available for sunlight if you had a mass where you got just above the horizon because the lighting at the poles is primarily conditioned by uh, the local horizon, not by the, the scale of the moon. And finally, we need to know about this issue about dust levitation and electrostatic charging. So if there are great electrical gradients as a result of going in and out of the, uh, the terminator and crossing these, these thermal boundaries, we need to know about that because that would impact our resource processing scheme. So how can we get some of this knowledge? Well, there's sort of four classes of, of mission approaches and instruments. I think additional remote sensing from orbit act could actually be valuable. One thing that could be done is by static imaging. Uh, the GRAIL mission has shown us that two spacecraft in tandem can make very sophisticated precision measurements. With two radar imaging experiments in orbit, you could actually vary the bistatic angle, the phase angle that you actually observe the diffuse reflections of the moon, which is where the unique sign signature for ice is. Impactors have a great potential. You could either have uninstrumented probes where you slam L-cross-like collision objects and look at the uh, plume that, that results from that, but actually, I've been more intrigued by things like hard landing probes, such as the uh, Russian Luna Glove mission, which will land penetrators to place a seismic net. Those penetrators could also make institute in measurements of hydrogen and ice concentration. Another possibility is to throw out crushable hard landers. And I've got a mid the middle illustration at left shows the concept of resurrected from the old Ranger, which was actually going to use a balsa wood sphere to place a seismometer on the moon. You could make a a crushable impactor with crushable aluminum foam. You don't want to use balsa wood because that would screw up your neutron measurement. But you could land instruments, hard lander instruments on the moon to apply multiple small spacecraft over a wide area and get measurements. The ideal way, of course, is to have rovers, long live rovers that travel into the sunlight, into the darkness, and out again over an extended period of time making multiple measurements. So finally, I'll close by saying, what's the value of lunar polar ice? Well, effectively, it's, the value is everything in spaceflight. Water is the most important substance you can have in space. It supports human life. You can drink it. You can breathe it. You can shield your habitat with it to protect you from radiation. It's a medium for energy storage with a rechargeable fuel cell. But most importantly, it will provide the fuel for a permanent space-based space transportation system. It effectively changes everything. So this whole idea about going to the moon being unaffordable, being in, too expensive to afford, is simply wrong. We're not approaching it the right way. We have to look at the moon as an enabling <clears throat> asset, not as a distraction that's on our way to Mars. So my contention is, is that the moon, in fact, is the gateway that we need to go everywhere else we want to go. By going <coughs> to the moon and using its resources, we create a system that allows us to go anywhere we want, to do any mission we want, for as long as we want. And that's the ultimate goal of spaceflight. Thank you. Wonderful, Paul. Another great talk. Um, I love your description of the moon as an enabling asset. I suspect about 99% of the people online uh, and, and in all the virtual hubs would agree with that. Um, nope. I, I, uh, um, so, so I wanted to ask uh, two questions, actually. Um, one, since we don't have any um, online 
actually we're getting some online, but I'll go first. <laughs> first of all, um, Chandrian, you mentioned uh, flew through this uh, 18 AMU uh, water cloud, as you mentioned. Um, is there any, any indication on uh, how broad that uh, spike was? I'm curious to indicate how big the cloud was. Yeah, I, I, I don't recall that exactly. That might be in the Chase paper, that CHASE, which, which they published in space, I think it was in Space Science Reviews. But it, would, it only lasted a, a few seconds. So it was on a scale of kilometers or so. It wasn't hundreds of kilometers. OK, all right. All right, and that could, that could potentially give you an indication of, of how long it had been spreading as well. So uh, all right. And then the other question I wanted to ask is, uh, um, there's been discussion off and on of a reflight of uh, M cubed. Do you think this has 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 things have things passed that by? Would this still be a worthwhile uh, instrument to uh, to put on a reflight since it didn't uh, measure the complete moon? Well, it did measure the complete moon more or less. It it would be better to get higher resolution data and 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 have more dwell time to actually observe the changing of uh, of the water absorption with time and position. So yes, I think it would be a valuable instrument to refly. OK, great. And uh, Dave Morrison has a question here. Hi, Paul. I'm questioning your, your great leap at the end from going back to the moon to having a viable infrastructure there that can support deep space, space flight and so forth. Is there any estimate as to how much we would have to invest in going to the moon before we could actually manufacture fuel and, and have a viable hub there that could be used for future expansion. Uh, yes, Dave, there is an estimate. I, I've made one. It's in the paper that Tony Lavoie and I published in 2011, which basically presented an architecture that uses teleoperated robots to emplace a lunar base. When you get to the point where you're making 150 metric tons of water per year, you have enough water to export to space. That The 150 metric tons will support two full human missions to the moon per year indefinitely. Beyond that, it's, it's, it's profit. Uh, our architecture basically uh, took about 16 years, and it cost $88 billion in real year dollars to do that. That's, a, that's, a, that's less than $7 billion a year, and we selected that value because that was the Augustine runout budget. OK, thanks. Thanks. Let me get to uh, one or perhaps two of the uh, online questions. Uh, first one is from Clive. The Brits have continued their penetrator development that was to be used for seismic studies um, could be retooled for lunar ice studies. With the speed of impact, what is your opinion of using penetration to explore the permanently shadowed regions of the moon? It, I guess it depends on what the speed of, of emplacement is. If, if it gets too fast, it's going to vaporize a lot of the water near the penetrator body. So you would want to slow that down as much as possible. But certainly, that's one way to get hard landers in place to make institute measurements. I think it, it has a lot of potential. Great, thanks. And let, well, we'll take one last uh, online question. Paul, do you, do you think it might be true in going from epithermal neutrons to CPR to L-cross, the deeper we go, the wetter it is? That, that's an interesting question, but the, the, I'm, I'm not quite prepared to go that far because all of those techniques are measuring different things. And, and it, but it does look like, in general, most of the water at the poles of the moon is not at the surface. It's actually anywhere from a few centimeters to a meter or two below the surface. OK. All right, great. Thank you. Um, thanks again for a great talk. And, and if you wouldn't mind, there, there are a couple of uh, questions left. If you wouldn't mind answering them online, um, we'd certainly appreciate that.